Good evening. I'm uh, Lou Tuosto with Let's Talk with Lou. And uh, I'm very uh, pleased this evening to have two wonderful guests. As usual, uh, our electeds are very, very good guests because they bring so much pertinent information to the Central Coast. And uh, I think tonight is probably one of the best lineups that we've had in some time. And I'd like to say, first of all, thank you for uh, being here to our viewing audience. And thank you for, I want to thank our crew right away because without our crew, we couldn't do this. We use volunteers, and on camera, we've got David Goldman. Um, we, we've got Frank Turner on camera. We've got graphics, we've got Karen Scott, who's been here for a while, uh, audio, Rob Gray, and our co-producer and director and former uh, ch uh, chair uh, of the community TV is uh, Keith Gudge, your personal friend. So uh, we just thank you, and our hats are off to you. So thank you so much for being here. And, and doing the things that you do and going through the trainings at community television. This is your show. Uh, tonight is a live show, but we will not do a call in, uh, which means that uh, we can't do any kind of editing. So if anybody blows it, you get to laugh at it. So <laughs> uh, tonight, uh, again, uh, I'm excited to have uh, two very prominent uh, politicians. Uh, and they uh, are movers and shakers, and uh, certainly uh, they're some of the best, I think, that we have. And uh, our first one, and, uh, guest is Jimmy Panetta, uh, of, and he's uh, the, in the California's 20th Cong Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives. And thank you for being here, Jimmy. Yeah, thanks, Lou. I appreciate the opportunity. It's always uh, great to be back. It's always great to be here in Santa Cruz and to have these types of discussions, uh, especially with people like you who know so much and ask uh, the relevant questions. I appreciate that, and it's an absolute honor this time to be on your show with the next person you're going to introduce, yeah. uh, Supervisor McPherson. I'm uh, so fortunate, uh, although a little intimidated uh, by the oh, yeah. fact that I get to share the stage with Bruce, <laughs> Bruce, considering how much he's done for this area, uh, a true public servant. And yeah. so it's a, it's a real honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Thanks for being here. Yeah, and you gave up, uh, you know, the, our other guests without the camera being on. You know. <laughs> uh, he is a, a regular of uh, Let's Talk with Lou and Community TV. Right. And I, I, when I give the, the formal longer uh, introduction, it could go on for a long time for both of you gentlemen, but so I'll just do the quick one. Uh, Bruce McPherson was reelected to the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors uh, in November 2016. He represents the 5th District, which includes San Lorenzo Valley, most of Scotts Valley, and a small part of Santa Cruz. And uh, for those that don't know, he was the former, he is the former Secretary of the State for the whole state of California, uh, Representative of the Year. Uh, he just br brings so much to Santa Cruz. And thank you for being here this evening. Thank you, Lou. It's great to be back. And uh, I really appreciate your show. I think uh, not just because we're on it, uh, but because um, it really, we were able to ex uh, pass on some information that I think is really relevant for them to hear. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, return the, the kudos to this, <laughs> this gentleman over here who's representing us, just uh, doing a terrific job in Washington, D.C. And that's not an easy job right now, <laughs> but uh, let's don't go there. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I really, it's, I really, it's a privilege to be here with, uh, with Jimmy. And uh, thank you for having me again. Good. Well, thank you for being here, Bruce. It's always, again, a pleasure to have uh, both of you gentlemen on, and you've been on uh, a few times uh, each, uh, so um, thank you again. I want to give a little bit more of an introduction uh, about Jimmy, uh, and I will give another one uh, about Bruce, but let's start out, um, actually, let me start out with, uh, with Bruce, um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about this and, and the things that you've done and some of the accomplishments um, and, and who you are and where you come from. Uh, you're a long and distinguished, uh, you have a long and distinguished record of serving Santa Cruz County uh, and a fourth generation Santa Cruz County native. Uh, Bruce's career began as a reporter uh, at, the, at the family newspaper. Of course, that's the Santa Cruz Sentinel, um, uh, later rising to, uh, to the, be the editor, uh, serving two terms on the California State Assembly, 93 to 96, two terms in the California State Senate, 96 to 2004, uh, following the resignation of California Secretary of State in early 2005, uh, confirmed unanimously in both Assembly and Senate uh, to be the Secretary of the State. Uh, and recognized, which is really impressive, uh, as the uh, legislator of the year in num by numerous organizations and foundations. Yeah, yeah thank uh, you. so, so you've got a great, great history. Um, and uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the things that you've done and, and, and uh, uh, committees that you uh, serve on. Uh, and, and I always talk about this one, which is a really cool one. The, the, the vote, uh, as I understand, uh, was the difference between us having uh, uh, the uh, oil rigs out in the bay and not having them like we have now right. was because of you. Well, somewhat, yes. Uh, that was um, 
uh, a very important vote for me and a very comfortable vote for me uh, to ban offshore oil drilling in the state waters was when I was in the state assembly. There were uh, at that time 40 Democrats and one Republican that said let's do that, let's ban that offshore oil drilling and uh, Governor Wilson signed the piece of legislation, the one that I'm most proud of, uh, actually, and, uh, but it, was, uh, it, it wasn't a problem for me. I, I had uh, editorialized on that, uh, that, that uh, it, you know, it's, the, the gain from that, if you will, isn't worth the, the, the potential destruction of what it can do for our coastline, our fisheries, the tourism industry and all. Um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a difficult vote, but it was an important one, as it turned out, when I was in the legislature, in the assembly. Okay, very good. Um, some of the committees that you serve on, Bruce, um, the Area Agency on Aging uh, and the Advisory Committee uh, Council there, Association of Monterey Bay Government Board of Directors, uh, California State Association of uh, County Board of Directors, a very impressive, Child Welfare Services System Improvement Plan Steering Committee, uh, the City Selection Committee, uh, First Five Commission, uh, Highway One Construction Authority, uh, and the Library Financing Authority, I think one of the last, uh, as an alternate, one of the last times we were here we were talking about libraries and funding. Yeah, it's, it's great. Yeah, and it's a, it's a privilege to serve my home county uh, more closely. Uh, people often ask me about what was the difference between the state and, and the local? Is it easier? Was it more difficult? It wasn't. There, if, if you do the job you're supposed to do as a public servant in the political world, uh, you put a lot of time into it. And uh, you realize that uh, uh, your time is not your own time, so to speak. Uh, you know, you, uh, there's a lot of things to do, and that's what you should do. That's what you're elected to do. But, yeah, some of those things that have just happened recently in my district uh, and throughout the county, when uh, voters in June of uh, 16 passed the library parcel tax, we just broke ground for the Felton Library. And uh, right next door is going to be a, an interpretive center park that uh, you, uh, it's first of its type, I think, in the state of California where we will have a library there. It's going to be about 9,000 foot library, square feet, and you can go next door over the bridge of Bull Creek there in Felton and then look at and interpret what you've just read about some of the environmental issues that you've, uh, you've picked up in the library. It's, it's fantastic and it, it is a community effort. Uh, you know, we, yeah, we, we're there to serve the people and you do not, you can say, I, I don't. I don't like to say I. Do. It's not the way it happens. It's we. It's a community effort. Boy, this yeah. that Felton Library was one that uh, yeah. was unmatched in front my uh, in my political career. It was yeah. just great. Yeah, under your leadership for sure. You're a very humble man. Uh, Jimmy's kind of chuckling about all the work that goes behind the, stuff, the scenes. And so, there's a lot of work. It's, oh, yeah. <laughs> sometimes thankless, but a lot of work for yeah. uh, for our electeds. You know, uh, we'll talk about that, making yourself accessible. Uh, and I guess it's the first time I, I, I've seen this, uh, and you, uh, you're not my supervisor, so I, I didn't uh, follow this very closely, but you meet uh, on a regular base, basis with uh, your constituents, in, uh, and, and you have a, a district meeting twice a month, uh, and uh, it's kind of a drop-in opportunity um, to, for people to meet you or your staff and talk about uh, issues of concerns. Could you talk a little bit about that, uh, where it's at, and, and what happens at those kinds of meetings? Sure, because um, in my tenure now, in my sixth year of uh, the 5th District Supervisor of Santa Cruz County, we've been able to uh, uh, open two uh, sheriff's offices, uh, substations, in, one in Felton and one just this last year in Boulder Creek. And so I, I go up to one or the other every week, or somebody in my staff does every week, mm -hmm. for people to drop in that can't make it down to the county center, or I'm up in the valley a, a lot. That's the main, probably two thirds of my uh, district is in San Ronzo Valley. Mm -hmm. So I wanna make a real point of going there and then off, uh, go to the city of Scotts Valley, but of course they have their own city government, so I think it's more important for me to go to, to the unincorporated area. And, and, that, um, and we, um, Boy, there's a range of discussions, I'll tell you. But mm -hmm. probably uh, health care, uh, transportation, um, the, 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 the housing situation is just immense here now, uh, mm -hmm. and the homeless situation. And there's some things we're trying to do it, but I feel really good about serving with my colleagues on the board. Uh, county government, we're, we're, uh, we're stable. We have a good reserve account now. Um, we're, we're going to get into some new plans of uh, implementing some new plans of a strategic plan that we have just developed in the last year. So it's exciting time, it really is. Okay. 
And uh, so people can come out and, let's say, uh, talk about their concerns or uh, maybe uh, gripes at those meetings. And, and, <laughs> yeah, there are a few of those sometimes. Yeah, yeah so okay. get used to it. But no, okay. you, you're right. Uh, you know, I just, it's your, it's your platform. You know, I, I'm here to tell me what, what's on your mind. Okay. And uh, yeah, I, I, it's enjoyable. I mean, that's, uh, I like doing that. Yeah, sometimes it's, uh, there's, there's differences of opinion, but that's, that's life in the, you know, the political world. Let's talk a little bit about, um, and back up a teeny bit, uh, and I'll do this for, for Jimmy too. Uh, what does a supervisor do? Um, you're in the unincorporated areas, um, and I think that people get an idea what a mayor does, or a city council person, or a school board person. But what exactly uh, does a supervisor do uh, in particular, because uh, you're, you're a paid politician, uh, and how do you implement policy, and what do you do with Well, we're that? probably the, really the direct agents of the state in particular, and the federal government, too, of, of money coming into the county, these grants and so forth that we read about so often. So we, we implement those, and, uh, our, and, uh, and we disperse the funds for them. Uh, we, I, I feel very good in uh, having been cooperating with the city of Scotts Valley, which is, I have probably 90% of the city in my district, and then it's a small portion of Santa Cruz. But working with other governmental agencies is very important to, uh, because um, you know, your air quality, your transportation network, it just doesn't stop at a, at a city li uh, limit line or, or county border. Uh, we have to see how we can make these things work together. And uh, when we do that, uh, it, it, and uh, people ask me again about the difference of the county government and the state, you're everything to everybody, in that, and you're the one representative, especially in the unincorporated area, that makes up probably two thirds of my district. So it's, uh, you're, the, you're their city council, you're their mayor, you're everything, uh, that they, if they wanna get political representation. So it's, uh, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I love my time in Sacramento, but I'm thoroughly enjoying this. Uh, especially one thing I really like about the County Board of Supervisors is you only probably have to count to three to get something done, yeah. you know, yeah. and yeah. not 21 or 41 as you do. <laughs> and, and the Lord uh, knows what it's like in Congress. Yeah, 218 in Congress. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but, uh, but no, it's been really good. We have a great team of effort, uh, great employees. Uh, we really want to get the job done right. We've got a great credit rating and bond rating right now. We're, we're uh, we, we have some issues we have to face, no question about it, but we're, we're on the right track. Okay, so in terms of um, what kind of issues do you predominantly see uh, some of your stakeholders in the community come to you about? I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of different things, but what would you say, that, let's say the majority? Well, right now it's the, uh, the concern about housing mm -hmm. and, uh, and a homeless issue, mm -hmm. and how do we address those? Uh, really hard, I mean, it's so expensive, the housing situation here, I mean, we're the, probably the most difficult place to uh, you know, have a house in, in the state of California, maybe the na one of the uh, most difficult in the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to try to make that work and how do we get more housing opportunities for that ne who need it? And my colleague, Zach Friend, just brought up a couple weeks ago uh, to waive the permit fees for the accessory dwelling units of up to 640 feet. That's seven or ten thousand dollars in that neighborhood to save if you waive those fees, mm -hmm. and building costs are huge. They're huge here, they're huge everywhere. So what can we do to allevi help alleviate that? Mm -hmm. um, I, it's gonna be very difficult to get a grip on this. Um, um, we're good, but we're not gonna stop trying, I'll tell you that. And another thing is that uh, I, um, I've me I mentioned this, the Measure G, we have a sales tax measure in the county government. And through our strategic plan that we went out to the community over a year to find out what, what do you, you care about the most, and they're concerned about the mentally ill and some, some the homeless that are there, they're uh, not all one and the same, but uh, what do we do for them? Now, the sheriff used to get uh, one, of, one call a day, maybe, uh, on a disturbance of this sort. Now he gets 10 a day. So yeah. we have, we're, with this sales tax revenue, should it pass, Measure G on uh, the November 6th ballot. Um, is it November 5th? I don't know. November 6th. 6th, 6th, 6th. 6th yes, yeah. excuse me. Um, the, uh, um, we, we, we want to get a team of sheriff's deputies uh, that are properly trained and some folks from the human services to have a, like a cl uh, clinician team mm -hmm. and to treat them as best we can in a short amount of time instead of them just have them come into jail, go out in 24 or 72 hours. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's try to 
let's take a different approach. Can, can I speak to that, Lou? Yes, uh, yes. You know, I, I, I appreciate that. That's very important because, as you know, Bruce, with AB 109 and Prop 47, right. they reduced the penalties on a lot of the low-level felonies or misdemeanors, and which is fine. And I think that was a, a, a good way to go about it. But the fact is we can no longer rely on the criminal justice system to house people uh, and to take care of people and rehabilitate people because they're not staying in custody that much longer. So what I'm saying is that they're out on the streets. And what AB 109 and Prop 47 were supposed to do is to save money from the people not being in prison. Right. And then that money was supposed to go to services and community services. But I think right now we're at a transition now where that money's not coming down. And I think it's wonderful that this is these are the ideas that you guys are coming up with to provide that the, the, that, that type of funding and those types of community services to address such an important issue in this area. So I think it's well, great. Thank, yeah, and I think it's, um, it's, it's discussed elsewhere, but this is a pretty new model, and we're, I think it's going to be very good uh, for the community at large, but most importantly for those people who knew, need the attention and the treatment yeah. immediately uh, instead of just getting in this revolving door and creating some chaos on, along the line. So we're, we're really excited about that. And I'm really, uh, really proud of our Board of Supervisors and our approach. And, and I appreciate the people in Santa Cruz County who really took, a, it was over 2,000 response that got engaged in what do we want for our county? Mm -hmm. And uh, I thank you for that because that gave, you know, that we, that's what we want to address. We want to hear what they have to say. Excellent, great. excellent. Measure G. Um, we talked about this before, but I think it's it's worth repeating if we could talk about that. Coming up on uh, the vote, and actually uh, most of us have their our, our, our ballots. Uh, they've been mailed out. Or, That's correct. Or they're getting mailed out uh, mm -hmm. as people are reviewing uh, what to do uh, and how to do it and maybe some interpretation. And I think uh, you've got a good following, uh, obviously, for uh, and people respect your opinion. Let's talk about that Measure G and how it might benefit us. Uh, I would say, well, I'm, I'm in the county as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's talk about how it might benefit us and what would it do? Yeah, it, Measure G is a half cent sales tax that was be, beyond uh, in the un un unincorporated area for 12 years. We have an oversight committee that would oversee what we're doing with the money and make sure we're doing what we said we were going to do, such mm -hmm. as this program I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, we, uh, I, it, it's a little different in that city voters, are, because of a recent state law just in the last year or two, will vote on that measure to increase possibly the sales tax by one half of one cent uh, in the unincorporated area. The theory being that people who live in the city buy goods elsewhere, so they're going to pay an increased tax on that. Um, it would raise probably about $5 million a year for us. Um, as I said, we have an oversight committee. We, uh, we have our ideas of what we want to do and how we want to uh, focus our attention on the revenues that come in from that. So um, we, uh, we feel very good. It's a majority vote. We'll, we'll uh, pass the measure. Um, I'm never overconfident, but I feel pretty good that people feel we're doing the right job of being very frugal and uh, considerate with the funding that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that we have 250 less uh, county employees today than we did 10 years ago and we're still doing a very good job because our employees are so outstanding yeah. that uh, I think that really says a lot. And so I, I hope we can do this because the community wants it. Another issue or, or subject would be parks. Uh, Leo's Haven is just going to be opening up tomorrow. Uh, this is for the special needs children, first of its kind in Santa Cruz County. Uh, there's been some oh tremendous people, a family that had some uh, needy children, and sh uh, they wanted to do this. They started, they sparked this. We're going to have the groundbreaking tomorrow at 10 o'clock mm -hmm. or uh, in Live Oak on Chanticleer Avenue. That's oh, very good. And we have, we, have one of, we have one of those in Salinas. Yes, in Salinas. In Salinas. You do. Yeah, yeah that. that's worth okay, good. That's right. That's absolutely right. That's so good. So um, in terms of uh, uh, Measure G, so uh, you, you're obviously, uh, you would like to see uh, that be vote, uh, voted on as a yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that comes up as a, not a super majority, but just a majority. So 50% uh, uh, yeah. plus one. Yeah. Uh, so it's likely that uh, it looks like, it, it looks positive. Uh, and so uh, to get out uh, and, and vote, uh, and you know, that's probably the biggest issue is get our folks out there uh, voting and get them to the polls. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would cost a half a cent sales tax. And that would put the county up to a nine cent uh, total which is still among the lowest in the county. 
a couple other cities have a higher than nine cent tax. Uh, a couple have a nine cent tax. Okay. So we're not even at the 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 cap of uh, nine nine and a quarter cents. So we think it's reasonable and uh, it's needed. And uh, we've um, we, um, there's been a lot of people, new people here, and we think this is the best way to address it and the programs that need it the most at this time. Not getting ahead of ourselves at all, but uh, have you thought um, how that, uh, and uh, maybe not, but maybe, have you thought about how that might be spent if it does, it does go through so people can maybe get more of a grasp on, okay, where's my half a penny going to? Sure. Well, that's it. I mean, it is with the, the, the Sheriff's Health Services Agency program. That's, that's the main cog. Parks in every each of the five supervisorial districts in the county would get some funding from it. Uh, we uh, we would we would also probably look at some of our other human services programs as well. Uh, there's um, uh, we we've gotten some great feedback. We this is where we can focus on this the first half year should this pass and it goes into effect the first uh, part of uh, 2019. This is where we said we wanted to target the funds at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, we will follow up with the plans that are, it's, it's a broad range plan that we have that the, the people have said they're, they're what they want. Uh, transportation is always a big thing, but we, we also, the state or the county voters passed Measure D uh, mm -hmm. last, uh, a couple of years ago too in November of 16. So that's helping us a lot. And uh, I'll tell you what will really kill that program though is if, um, Proposition 6 on the November ballot, statewide Proposition 6, if it passes, um, we're, a lot of our transportation funding is going to, it's coming to a standstill. That's right. So no so on Prop so, 6. Yeah. yeah. No Agreed. Six. Okay. Agreed. And Bruce, uh, just talk to me a little more, if I may, sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, about Measure D. Where, uh, tell me what, where we're seeing the effects of that. Um, and I say that because we want, I think, it's, I think it's great that the citizens of Santa Cruz County passed that. Yeah. I know when I was running last time in 2016, three out of the four counties um, in my congressional district passed self-help infrastructure yes. uh, type of propositions, and, or measures, excuse me. And then the, third, the fourth one who didn't pass was San Mateo Santa County. Lu it's on the ballot again this right. year. Uh, and so I just kind of want to encourage them to- Yeah, we, we had a, uh, uh, um, a, a committee that looked at this for two years. How do we do this? What do people want? And so we said, not everything uh, transportation-wise goes into one pot. There's, a, there's variables in our transportation network. Mm -hmm. Number one priority, top priority of 30% of the funding that was received will go to local roads. And that was a two, by that way, that was a two thirds vote that was needed in that because it's specific to a subject. Uh, and we, it was over 68% that voted yes on that. So that That's was good. just terrific. Um, the, uh, so it, our local roads, uh, the Highway 1, which is, uh, you know, a, a nightmare and it, it's really a difficult situation. Uh, we also put, uh, gave 20% to uh, trans, uh, the transit districts and apparently, you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the special needs, uh, the buses that uh, are needed for, the, for that. And then for, for bikes and pedestrians too for your, your over trip. So we said, let's fit to have something for everybody in this and we're delivering on that. But, but local roads and we suffered so, so, such severe tragedy or uh, destruction, I should say, uh, with our roads oh, and the 216, cool. 17 floods and, or, and yeah. rainstorms, we're, we're coming back on that. And sure. you mentioned the term self-help county. Yes. Uh, and when the state sees that you have helped yourself exactly. literally like mm -hmm. this and taxing yourself, yes. they will give to you. Uh, not, less than half the counties are self-help counties. So we will get, that, that could mean millions of dollars for us every year. And that money will come from the gas tax, yes. correct? Yes, right. That's so right. that was real pivotal uh, uh, when Measure D went through yes. uh, in that uh, certainly we've got the revenue, which is great. We need it. We've got places to put it. Uh, we've got repairs. I mean, we got all that stuff kind of earmarked. But the big thing in my mind uh, was that we became a self-help county, uh, which we weren't prior to that, right. which means we get matching dollars from the feds and matching dollars from the state. Uh, and, and it works really well in terms of getting more than we anticipated. And we've gotten up to this point. It's a lot more money yeah. potential. Yeah. And like I said, if, uh, if Proposition 6 passes, a lot of that's not going to get here. It, you're not going to get anywhere. It's going to just be withdrawn. I mean, it's going to be... Uh, the, the, our gas tax in, in California hasn't been increased in more than 20 years, the state gas tax. Uh, the, uh, and if this doesn't make it, or if, if this doesn't withstand 
the the Prop Six and uh, you know measure and people if they uh, if they uh, say that you you're going to take it away by with a referendum, uh, that's just going to set us back and we won't have another gas tax increase. And you have to have money to to build you know gas tax or uh, highways and your byways and your bikeways and so forth. And and they're uh, they're much. Uh, a highly uh, volatile subject is the train, but that discu that discussion discussion is is about ready to comp come upon us in this next year. You know, it's always amazing. Um, it, it's been a lot of years ago, but uh, uh, having traveled to England, uh, actually my, my son was studying there. Uh, the cost of fuel there is, is astronomically, you know, uh, oh, more yeah. than what we're doing here. And so to, to do something with that, I mean, it, it seems like a no on Proposition 6 yeah. uh, is kind of a, a no-brainer. I've heard that the, the average, for the average driver, year-round driver, that half-cent sales tax is going to cost you about $140, $150 a year. A year? A year. And maybe, gonna... maybe up to 200 but that's, oh, yeah, that's I've heard yeah. up, up that, but 140 to 200 a year. Is it that's worth it? it? Yeah, that's if minimal. we don't do it, uh, it's going to take a long time to get these roads yeah. repaired. Well, good, good stuff as usual. Uh, uh, boy, I appreciate all, uh, all your insights, and um, uh, you know, it's it's good to know what we need to be voting on. At least, you know, how you feel about it, and we get it firsthand in terms of uh, you know an opinion that we can trust for sure. And then actually going back and forth, uh, uh, that that's, that's really neat because you've got you know the federal uh, uh, way of looking at it, uh, federal government, uh, and to know about what's going on locally. It all, obviously, it all affects uh, affects all of us in a in a special way. Well, I'd, I'd love to say that the federal government was actually stepping up and doing their part on infrastructure, uh, but unfortunately, uh, I can't at this point. But clearly, that is a topic that uh, we want to tackle uh, come 2019 with the 116th Congress, because I believe that although you know pretty much throughout the country everybody agrees that infrastructure needs to be funded, there needs to be a proper way to go about funding that such an infrastructure uh, investment. But the fact is, we can't figure out how to do that at this point, unfortunately. Um, okay. And it, there's a number of options that are out there. Uh, I just hope that there's leadership from the top on this issue as well. And I think if there is, we'll yeah. be able to do it. I do too. It's, it seemed to me that infrastructure, transportation could be something that you, there could come, everybody knows it's needed. I mean, for the convenience of people, the time, the economy, everything. I mean, it, right. who, I mean, it's just a basic component of our success story in our communities or in the United States. And so I hope we yeah. do that. And as president of uh, Santa Cruz Metro, our public transit system, bus system, I'm really hoping that your fast track, you know, there's some, there's some, uh, bills that are coming up. He's and Jimmy, believe me, he's at the top. He's uh, of this uh, on top of it, uh, and you're a co-author on some of these things about giving, you know, making sure that that is stabilized and maybe increased. In yeah. fact, yeah, and it's not it's not just you know roadways. It's airways. It's it's waterways, especially making sure that our water is secure and safe. Uh, and it's basically that type of investment that needs to be done. It's just figuring out mm -hmm. from the federal point of view where that money is coming from, and hopefully we can do that next year. Let's talk about, good segue, uh, let's talk about uh, what you do in your job, uh, Jimmy. What do, does a congressman do? Uh, uh, and, and certainly uh, you've you're, uh, been on going into your third year now? Uh, no, this is my, uh, I'm in about 21 months. 21 months, okay, yeah. so second year, yeah. almost. Uh, it, let's talk about what you do, who you represent, um, what areas sure. um, that you, you represent, uh, and talk about the kinds of things that, let's say, uh, uh, some of our listeners might be interested in going, oh, okay, that's Jimmy's jurisdiction, yeah. let me talk to his office, <clears throat> let me go to one of his meetings, uh, let me write and let me email him, but let's talk about that a little bit. If sure, you yeah, no, I, I am the uh, United States representative for the 20th Congressional District in California. To me, that is the central coast of California. Mm -hmm. I go back and forth with uh, Salud Carbajal, who's just <laughs> south of here, <laughs> representing San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara, and I say, no, 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 we are the central coast, especially if you look at a map but especially of how it feels. Uh, and so I represent this area uh, and the values and the people of this area back in Washington, D.C. Uh, obviously making sure that uh, what we have here, uh, be it our environment, be it our uh, immigration policy, uh, be it our infrastructure policy, uh, that, that those are protected and those are fought for back in Washington, D.C. And, and of those topics especially, uh, a lot there's a lot of fight that needs to be done, especially in Washington. Uh, but at the same time, I represent, you make sure that you represent the people here. And I love what Bruce said about having those meetings with people. Uh, in my limited time in Congress, we've had over, I think, 
think, 800 meetings with constituents and groups here in the district. 800? Yeah, over wow. 800. Because okay, you're out there. Uh, yeah, no, well, you have to be because, look, for one, I'm, you know, I'll, even though I grew up in this area, I went to school in this area, I worked in this area, I have my wife's a judge in this area, I have daughters who go to the same schools I went to, uh, you know, you realize that there are certain areas of this district that you do not uh, no, and so it's always good to have these types of meetings, and so we kind of have an open door policy. Yeah. I mean, I learned that from people like Bruce and people ahead of me who had office hours, just kind of opening up your door and letting people come in. And so that's mm -hmm. what I've told my staff is that people want to meet with me, we're going to do that, and we have done that. We're right. going to continue to do that, but it's making sure that they know what services we can provide as a Congress member. As what inspired me to get into this job is uh, the policy is important, and I understand that, but it's the constituent services, how I saw growing up can actually affect people's lives. Mm -hmm. To this day, people make it a point to come up to me and mm -hmm. tell me that when they had a veterans issue, they weren't receiving their benefits. When they had a social security issue, they weren't receiving their benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, when they had a housing issue, uh, they went to their Congress member, and let me tell you, their Congress member did something for them mm -hmm. that actually helped them personally, and mm -hmm. they will never forget it. Why? Because it not only affected them, it affected their family, and as I look at it, it affected their family's future here on the Central Coast. Sure. And so I make it a point that constituent services are my number one priority, making sure that I am that bridge, that I and my staff and my office are that bridge from the Central Coast mm -hmm. to Washington, D.C., and the bureaucracy that you have to deal with in some of these areas, and back. That's my role. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, and many people know, especially if you're a veteran, dealing with the VA can be tough. Right. And there are people who work in that bureaucracy who automatically say no. Mm -hmm. And what I tell my staff is if it doesn't sit right with you and it doesn't make sense, let's push back and get them to yes. Mm -hmm. And you have to do that a lot of times. And so that's what we're there for. So if you do have a veterans issue, if you do have a social security issue, come to my office, let us know, and we'll help you with that issue as best as we can. But that's our job, and that's my number one goal, to continue to represent our values on the Central Coast out in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and continue to represent the people here on the Central Coast locally and being that bridge to, the, to our nation's capital and back. So what I'm hearing from you uh, is that uh, you, you definitely are out there and, and, you're, and you're talking with people because you want to find out what the needs are. Um, what, what would you say um, is one of the biggest needs uh, of our Central Coast folks that you're talking to one-on-one? -on -one? Certainly, you, you know, you're a representative of a native your, uh, of the, uh, the veterans, uh, and as well as being you know, such a, a local, yeah. you get it. Uh, yeah. You know what's going on in this community. Um, being decorated in the military, you, you know, active service, you've got some experience, uh, you, you know firsthand what that's all about. Mm -hmm. So you're not, you know, sitting just in D.C. or at home talking about it. You, you're, you're in there, you've been there, done that. What would you guess is uh, a, a, our number one need that we have uh, and, and that, are, that are being brought to you and they're saying, like, we've got to have this. I mean, what, 30 percent, 50 percent or whatever the bulk of the people talking to you about that is really, truly yeah. something that you'd like to see changed in D.C.? Yeah, look, I, I think based on what, how you just summed up that question, <laughs> seeing being changed in D.C., I believe that the number one priority for this area in Washington, D.C. is immigration and immigration reform. Mm -hmm. I think being from here, having a, a grandfather who came here from Italy uh, as, a, as an immigrant who basically worked his way through this country and fortunately for, for us, for my family, settled here on the Central Coast, thank goodness, uh, and basically lived that American dream, give, basically giving his children a better life. Uh, so I appreciate those efforts. I appreciate the risk he took. I appreciate the risk that so many of our friends, neighbors, and family members take to come here to give mm -hmm. their children a better life. Mm -hmm. You can't help but appreciate that being from the central coast of California. We have a huge immigrant population and those immigrant population, th that immigrant population obviously helps our economy, but I believe it's our community, it's what our country's about, but it's also what our culture is about. It's who we are. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that Congress has failed uh, immigrants and failed on immigration reform, to be frank. They got close in 2013 when they put together a comprehensive immigration reform package that actually passed out of the Senate, but unfortunately the House never took it up for a vote. And then we are dealing with an administration now who, ever since it was candidate Trump back in June of 2015, uh, has spewed an anti-immigrant rhetoric. 
to be frank. Mm -hmm. And ever since he took office in January of 2017, mm -hmm. we've seen a consistent pattern of decisions that are anti-immigrant, starting with the Muslim, Muslim ban, then going with the revo revocation of the temporary protected status of people who have come here from certain uh, countries uh, and seeking asylum, and now we've given them temporary protected status. status. Then there was a repeal of the Deferred Action on Childhood Arrivals Program, DACA. Then you saw the family separation policy at our border where families, mothers and fathers were being separated by their children mm -hmm. uh, as they were fleeing violence in Central America. And then just recently you're seeing a change in the definition of what is a public charge and being and they're making that change in order to use against immigrants who are here legally to not allow them to get uh, further legal status or, or uh, a legal permanent residency. And so I believe it's up to us to make sure that we continue to push back on this administration, one, but two, actually come together and pass immigration reform, making sure that our dreamers are protected, making sure that those uh, men and women who want to come here and work in agriculture, who have worked in agriculture, who want to continue working in agriculture can do that, uh, and making sure that uh, not only those men and women, but the families who are now here, mm -hmm. the children who are now here, who are American citizens, that they, that we understand that as well. You can't just take a person and remove them because there are citizens attached to them now. There are families here. It's a whole, it's a whole process. And and uh, we got to make sure that the administration understands that. We have to make sure that there are other districts throughout this country that understand that. Because trust me, in my discussions with Republican colleagues uh, throughout this country, um, we're in a bubble here. Thank God we're in a bubble here on the Central Coast. We're proud to live here. We're proud to have uh, a, an immigrant population here that has contributed to our community here. But I have to tell you that there are a number of other districts throughout this country that don't have that. They aren't as lucky as we are. In fact, four-fifths of Republican districts have a below average number of immigrants in their districts. So it's not as pressing of a priority. But the more we have discussions, the more they hear from me, the more they have empathy for what's going on, the more they have understanding, and the more we can get them to yes when it comes to immigration reform. It's going to be difficult with this administration at this point. I can't stress that enough. But it's not going to stop us from, one, having these discussions, mm -hmm. two, telling the story of immigrants, especially here on the Central Coast, and three, ultimately, trying to pass comprehensive immigration reform. And if anybody's going to get it and see it through, it's going to be Jimmy Panetta, believe me, because I know that he's been working with Republicans, Democrats as well, but to try to get this done. I mean, I just would wish that your, some of your colleagues would just say, let's don't fight about it. Let's, what is it that would be okay to make this work? Because that's what, that's what the, the job of Congress is. They're going to have to be the ones that do it. Uh, I, I, just, uh, I just wish we could... Uh, you know, get more um, yeah. cohesion in that yeah. in, in, in Congress. And yeah, I, I appreciate your leadership in that in the, in the Congress. Yeah, too. no, we're trying. I mean, obviously, because it's so important here, and uh, as a grandson of immigrants, I get it. But, uh, you know, one of the areas that we actually have been having these discussions is one of the caucuses I'm on called the Problem Solvers Caucus. Mm. It's a purely bipartisan caucus of 24 Democrats, 24 Republicans. Mm. And when the president decided to terminate the DACA program uh, and gave us six months to come up with some sort of legislation, uh, a group of us, I led the Democratic effort, uh, I led the Democratic side within the Problem Solvers Caucus. There were about eight of us and the eight Republicans. We actually came together and we we're actually talking about it. We we're actually in late, we spent many late nights literally cramped in each other's offices, kind of taking pieces of legislation, the Democrat version and the Republican version when it came up to saving our dreamers, and actually going line by line and seeing where we can compromise on that. And it's very difficult. And I gotta tell you, in my limited time, in Washington, D.C., I can tell you that immigration is the most policy complex mm -hmm. uh, and most politically sensitive issue that I've dealt with. And it's because of the differences that we have throughout our country and because of the different constituencies we have. But the fact is that if you're able to sit down with members who want to sit down and solve this issue, we can do it. And we did it. We actually came up with principles, not just with saving our dreamers, but we then talked about border security because that was important to Republicans and their constituency mm -hmm. having to go back to their constituency and say, okay, yeah, I did something for Dreamers, because their response they got was, from their constituents was, well, then what are you doing to protect our border? You know, that's, mm -hmm. that was just because of this administration, that message, that's what they had to deal with. So we also talked about border security, and we met with Border Patrol, we met with the head of Border Patrol, we met with people who were on the border, we met, we, a few members went to the border, and we actually had those discussions, it was important, we actually came up with a compromise on it to show leadership, to show the administration, look, 
Here is a group of Democrats and Republicans that can agree on these types of principles. Let's do something about it, just to kind of give them motivation. And unfortunately, with leadership in Congress, not on both sides it can be difficult, and with this administration, it was difficult. Mm -hmm. But that's not going to stop us. In the 116th Congress, that's going to be a priority for me. I do believe it's going to be a priority, uh, hopefully, for the Democratic Party, which hopefully is, is in power at that point. What happens when you come together with that great work, uh, and let's say you do come to some agreement, what, what do you do with that information? Where does it go? Uh, obviously, we're talking about it here live on the show, yeah. uh, and, and, our, and our, our listeners are going, wow, you're doing some stuff that's really good. You're, you're, you're yeah. walking across both aisles, and you're getting, get, getting everybody to work on these particular issues. And this, this particular one is issue, uh, issue is immigration, which is probably one of the toughest ones, because yeah. it hits, at some level, it hits us all. Uh, in a special way, because we all come from someplace else, my family too. Uh, and, and so uh, what do you do with that information? How do you um, show you know, the success that you had so that, that can in fact be a model for other you know, groups that are working on things like that? What yeah. do you do with it? Yeah, no, look, people, people knew that there were a group of Democrats and Republicans who were working on this. And part of that is uh, based on us just talking about it. Part of us is having discussions with leadership. Because let me tell you, once leadership, Democratic leadership, found out that problem solvers were working on immigration with Republicans, they got a little nervous. Uh, don't you know? I, I, politically, that was their purpose of why they got nervous. And, but we had then we had those discussions. We let them know what we're doing, and actually, the Senate heard about it, and we actually started working with Senate leaders, Democrats and Republicans. And they actually, when the Senate was negotiating their four bills when it came to Dreamers and border security, they actually looked at the principles we passed because of our negotiations and our discussions with senators, and used them uh, in coming up with one of their four uh, pieces of legislation that unfortunately was voted down. All four were voted down or didn't pass, I should say. But, but you're making some segues in terms of, of showing how are. to do this kind exactly. of stuff. So you're, in that yeah. sense, you've got some success for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's kind of planting the yeah. seed and you can take that in other arenas. Uh, that's pretty impressive. Uh, it's, it's, it's important. And let me tell you, it's just called doing your job, <laughs> to be frank. And I hate to say it like that, but I'm telling you, legislating in Congress is, is starting to be a lost art, unfortunately. And, mm -hmm. and what I'm, one of the lessons I've learned is that in Congress, people have conclusions, and then they try to find evidence to support those conclusions. Mm -hmm. And as a prosecutor, that's not how I learned how to do things. I knew that I, early on in my career as a prosecutor, I couldn't just stand up in court and say, he's guilty, and sit back down. It's just not how you do things. You basically put on evidence, you put on witnesses, you mm -hmm. show the jury the evidence you have, and they make the conclusion based on that evidence. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that's not being done in, in Washington, D.C., especially on these major pieces of legislation. And I believe that you are having legislators who have been there these last decade who just don't know how to legislate. I mean, I'll give you an example. One of these late night sessions that I was having in the Problem Solvers, I remember walking away about 12 o'clock at night, walking out of the office with a legislator who had been there for 10 years, and he turned to me and he said, wow, Jimmy, I've never done that before. <laughs> You've never sat down with the other side and talked about legislation line by line that's in order you're being paid to for. come up. Exactly. <laughs> but that, 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 that's part of the problem in Washington, D.C. Yeah. That is part of the, uh, the dysfunction that we're seeing. But I can tell you, a lot of the newer, younger members who are getting there, they've heard from their constituents like I heard from my constituents, that it is time for us to get something done but more importantly, do it together. Mm -hmm. And I think that message is going to uh, be perpetuated uh, with these new candidates that, uh, th with these candidates that are going to be elected to Congress in the 116th, be a Democrat and be a Republican. Because I'm telling you, especially after these last couple of weeks, uh, there's, there's an open wound and it needs to be healed. And I believe that if we can come together uh, and work together, and what I'm hearing from my constituents is that needs to be done more and more. And I'm telling you, there's a group in Washington, D.C. that is doing it. You aren't hearing about it. Obviously, the press likes to talk about the dysfunction and, and the divisiveness. But let me tell you, there's a group of members that I'm a part of, and I'm proud to be a part of it, that actually is working together and having reasonable discussions. But what's great about that is we're not only having discussions on legislation. We're not only work, we're working with policy. I get to know the person. I get to know the representative. And more importantly, I get to know the people that he or she represents mm -hmm. in these other districts outside mm -hmm. of California. And then I'll learn from them what exactly they can say yes to. You know what I mean? Because sometimes their constituency 
not going to allow them to go certain ways. And I get that, but mm -hmm. at least I'll know that and have that empathy and that understanding so that when I go to him and ask him, hey, what do you think about this piece of legislation that I'm trying to put forward? I know what he's going to say. I know where he's going to be at. Mm -hmm. But it's that type of empathy that I think needs to be developed. There needs to be more of that foundation, those personal relationships that I believe can lead to professional relationships. I mean, that's just, like I said, a lot of this is common sense, but unfortunately, politics get in the way and they prevent that, uh, that the, the personalities from coming together, and that's a shame. But I can tell you, it's, we're, we're working to change that. So to be able to get uh, into uh, some, some of the, the nitty gritty and the nuts and the bolts of all the kinds of the things that you guys talk about is relationship oriented. It's huge. Yeah. It's huge. Oh, yeah. It's absolutely huge. And you can ask Bruce. I yeah. mean, Bruce oh, saw that Bruce. up in Sacramento yeah. Uh, yeah. and how important that is. Correct me if I'm wrong, oh, but no. I think it, that's it a huge is, part uh, of it. And it's in the best legislation uh, as a result of that. It, right. it really is. Yeah. Because it's not all one way or the other. With that, uh, Well, maybe some you know, a particular group went, went at one time or another, but it, that's, the way the best less, that's the way the best legislation gets uh, passed and signed by a president or a governor. Yeah, it really I think, is. I, I think, and I, I think part of it is you bring people to the table, you talk about it, you get them involved, then they have skin in the game. And they're attached to that legislation. So rather than having it pass and then being attacked all the way through, they're going to be kind of, yeah. they're part of it. Yeah. Uh, an example I can say, look, I, I, it's passage of the ACA. I mean, I support the Affordable Care Act. It's, it, it has benefited a number of people in this community. Sure. But, you know, what I also heard is that it's too expensive and the, right. the, the people lack accessibility now. They may have health care, but they need more access to doctors. And so it needs to be fixed. And so when we started having discussions about how we fix it, I can tell you, there were Republicans who didn't want anything to do with it. I mean, Tom Cole, a legislator from Oklahoma, he told me a quote. He basically said, look, he said, uh, there were Republicans who voted against that. Why would we want to fix it? Um, Joe Barton, a Republican from Texas, told me the story. We were at a bipartisan dinner, and he told me the story about how um, he had tried and tried to set up a meeting with the chairman of the Energy and Commerce, Henry Waxman, uh, before the bill was dropped. Timer. Yeah, before the bill was dropped. And they set a couple of meetings, they got canceled. Next thing you know, the chairman drops the bill. And Joe Barton basically said, well, wait a second, mm -hmm. what about us? And uh, that's how, I know there were amendments added to it, but the bitterness that Joe felt and that I felt from listening to him tell this story, you could tell this is mm, interesting. It's difficult. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult. But, but let me tell you, the good thing is, is that 57% of the members who are around when the ACA passed, they're no longer there. Mm. So it, it, it's, it's changing. And let me tell you, there's already, you have about 45 Republicans who have, who have either stepped down or are retiring or stepping down. You have over 20 Democrats who are stepping down or have already stepped down. And so no matter who takes control of the House, it's going to be a different Congress. Mm -hmm. And I just hope that there are members who are willing to sit down at the table and actually have these types mm -hmm. of discussions that we're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Um, let's switch gears a little bit, Jimmy. Uh, the president's tried to roll back some environmental protections. Um, and what are you working to combat? Try tried to. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is a, this is, a, I mean, look, we just, uh, yesterday or the day before, the United Nations came out with this scathing report uh, about our climate change mm -hmm. and basically letting us know, and I say us and I mean that, letting the leaders and letting the people of the world know, we need to act now mm -hmm. and if we don't, there's going to be significant consequences within the next 10 years. And I believe that the previous administration understood that and actually took steps forward for the United States to be a leader in addressing the effects of climate change. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, this administration is taking two steps back. You saw that in the decision to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accords. Mm -hmm. You saw that in the administration's decision to stop implementing the Clean Power Plan, which would reduce carbon emissions by 30% by 2030. Mm -hmm. You saw that with the appointment of Scott Pruitt to the Environmental Protection Agency and what Scott Pruitt did, not only his uh, unethical actions within the office, but his rollback of numerous regulations within the EPA. And so we are constantly battling this administration who is failing to lead not just our country, but the world when it comes to protecting our environment and dealing with the effects of climate change. Um, but this isn't what we're seeing though. And, and look, and this is also a, a president who has put three executive orders uh, forward 
that are, uh, the intent is to open up this coast to offshore oil drilling. And so that's why, oh, the, oh. oh yeah, you bet. There were three executive orders that basically said, mm -hmm. we need to figure out what are the resources out there and if there are potential for offshore oil drilling out there. Then that's right. And so fortunately, there's a process before these orders can go in place. Mm -hmm. There was a public comment period. Everybody commented, which is great. And we made sure that the people here on the ground understand mm -hmm. uh, about those comment periods. And the, regu they, the, the regulations, as a result, have yet to come out at this point, I believe, because mm -hmm. so many people commented on the federal regulations website. Uh, and we'll continue to do that. Um, and and the, that's, that, that's also why the first bill that I co-sponsored mm -hmm. was preventing oil drilling off the coast of California. I mean, now we are lucky that we've had people like Bruce. We've had people, uh, other legislators from the Central Coast who have been stalwart uh, legislators who basically protected our environment. And, but as I say, as I, I like to say, you know, uh, as my wrestling coach taught me, you know, look, once you made your mark in the world, watch out for those with the erasers. Mm -hmm. And right now, this administration is trying to come up with some pretty damn big erasers. Mm -hmm. And we have to continue to protect the marks that, uh, that Bruce has made, that our other legislators have made before us. Uh, and that's what I intend to do. But, you know, this, unfortunately, if it's not going to be a top-down effort, Thank God it's a bottom-up effort, especially on the Central Coast, especially people like Supervisor McPherson, who has been a leader on the Monterey Bay Community Power Plan, uh, implementing that. And that's what it's going to take. It's going to take states like California, who is trying to do their best, and leaders like Jerry Brown, to ignore this administration and just go forward with being a part of the Paris Climate Accord and making sure that even though uh, the president said the nation doesn't have to abide by the Clean Power Plan, California is agreeing to do that, coming up with its own regulations mm. uh, and yeah. so its own protections. And so that's very important. And so, like I said, it's those types of bottom-up efforts that we have to have in order to address the effects of climate change. If this administration isn't going to do it, we are going to do it. And I think we will continue to do that in Congress, especially when we have people here, like Supervisor yeah. McPherson, who's and willing I, to do it I here. I could chime yeah. in, uh, and just uh, you're with Monterey Bay Community Power. This is the most satisfying yeah. thing I've ever done in my public service life. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, we started this four or five years ago. Uh, we were gonna just do it with Santa Cruz County and its four cities. I said, no, I've represented this area. They would, they would be a bigger, we could have a bigger envelope. And so we said, uh, people rolled their eyes and said, wow, okay. And so instead of maybe a year or two, it, it's taken us four years, but it's in place. We were established. Uh, we we uh, launched seven months ago, Monterey Bay Community Power. Uh, and what, what that is, is we, uh, all of our electric electricity is produced from non-carbon resources, wind, uh, you know, solar, uh, um, your hydro. And uh, we, uh, we, we started on this journey and we, uh, um, and I, this is a cooperative effort if there ever was one because it's the first tri-county uh, agency of its type uh, in the state and maybe, the, I don't know, the nation. It's, but Monterey, Santa Cruz, and San Benito County are involved. We have 260,000 customers with 800,000 people that are, it's carbon free. We are going to do it at less cost. Mm -hmm. Your electrical bill will be less cost. And we have local governance, a policy board and an operations board, and, and also a community um, advisory committee. Um, we have, uh, it's, people have really welcomed this and received it. We have a, a 90, 95% uh, of our commercial and residential customers are with us now. And we, uh, there's a standard that the state set for 2019 in your greenhouse gas emissions, or 2030, we're gonna meet that next year, wow. the reduction of that. And, and, that, and, we redu and uh, the debt that we had for startup start costs that we thought was gonna, we're gonna take seven uh, or uh, three, uh, two years to, to uh, we're, we're gonna do it in seven months. Wow. It's done, wow. it's done wow. right now. No, that, that's so what I'm saying. Done. I mean, it takes, uh, and this, that's what this report was saying. It basically takes the people. Uh, yeah, obviously, they want the country leaders to step up and take charge. But if that's not going to happen, it takes the people to take charge. And, and that's yeah. why we're so lucky that people like Bruce, yep. people like John Laird, yep. people like Sam Farr, uh, the guy before Sam Farr has a nose like mine, uh, <laughs> you know, those types of people who understood how important our environment is, not just for us, but for our future.
Yeah. The time goes by. What, what a great discussion. This has kind of, been one of the best. You guys, I love the cross, uh, you know, talk and uh, great stuff. We're almost there. Um, if you could sum up, uh, give us about two minutes, uh, Bruce, and then I'll finish with you, Jimmy, and you can talk about something that our listeners want to remember this night by. Give me about two minutes or less. Well, I, I think um, for me right now, it's uh, that the, the, the county government is in good position right now. Uh, I am appreciative of the way the voters have supported some of our our uh, proposals, uh, and this is countywide, of course, not just the County Board of Supervisors and libraries, uh, transportation and all. But uh, for me right now, it's the, the implementation, the continuation of Monterey Bay Community Power. Okay. This is very, very important, and it's, uh, it's, it's critical. It's, we're in place, we're on our way, and it's going to be with us forever, and it's going to be good for us all. Excellent. Good. Thank you, Bruce. And Jimmy, mm -hmm. a couple minutes, maybe even less. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I, I think right now, federally, what I'm hearing and what we're all seeing when we turn on the TV, we see a lot of divisiveness. We, feel, we see a lot of dysfunction. Um, and people are, are, are distraught. There's no doubt about that. But the fact is, is that, look, our country has been through worse times. And the reason that we've been able uh, to exist is because we've persisted. Sure. And the way we've been able to persist is because we are a democracy, yes. uh, not just of me, the president, but of we, the people. Yes. And that's why I can't stress enough, it takes we, the people, to get through. And that's why I think it's important that we get out and we vote. I do not want to hear that my vote doesn't count. Every single vote counts. Yes. We have an election coming up. I want people to make sure they get to the polls no matter who they are, no matter where they are. We need people to get to the polls. That's how our democracy works. That's how we're going to get out of this time. So get to the polls, and that will make a difference. Definitely. Yes. Sure uh, does. Okay, good. Good stuff. Good, uh, good stuff. Um, any other last comments? I, I already, uh, uh, again, thanked our staff uh, and, and the folks that come in and our volunteers. and They do such a great job. But again, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. I know each of you have busy schedules uh, in the middle of, you know, all the fun stuff that you're doing to come out and do community <laughs> TV. Um, that means a lot to our, our, our community at large. Um, you know, we are a, 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 just a small community TV location. Uh, we've got a little uh, group of people that are volunteers, but they do a great job. Yeah, um, definitely. And, uh, you know, if anybody is interested uh, in coming out and finding out about community TV, um, go to our website. We archive all our, almost all of our shows. Uh, many of them uh, are uploaded to uh, YouTube, and uh, you can kind of see uh, what happens and see the progression of how uh, we do shows. Um, and they get, they're getting better and better. I think broadcasting is getting uh, much more of a higher quality uh, than what we had even you know, three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is your show. This is your community television station. Uh, come in and, and just feel comfortable uh, with uh, writing or emailing and coming by and letting us know how we, we can improve things for you. Uh, if you'd like some special guests, uh, let us know too. Um, I'm at ljtuosto at aol.com. And again, I thank you so much for being here uh, with Let's Talk with Lou on Community TV, Channel 72 and 27. And we try to do this on Thursday nights, but uh, uh, many times uh, we do it a different uh, night as well. So. Again, thank you, and uh, we will see you next time, next week. Um, next Thursday, we're going to have uh, the uh, president of uh, UCSC, uh, President Blumenthal. Mm. So uh, it's going to be great. And we will have uh, our board of trustee chair from Cabrillo College uh, on as well to talk about educational issues. So thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good one. Yeah.